We covered ionic compounds, and ionic compounds are held together by and, well, electrostatic attractions, which we call ionic bonding. We covered covalent compounds or molecular compounds, which are held together by the sharing of electrons, which leads to what's called covalent <laughs> bond. And so the theory of bonding uh, in terms of chemistry has evolved trying to explain why it is that certain molecules would get together at certain ratios, uh, why certain elements can get together, other elements cannot get together, and then how their three-dimensional shape is dependent on those bonds. And that kind of historically, then it started with Lewis structures, which is and then it developed into something called hybridization, and then to something called BACPR. And then eventually they said, you know what, none of this really explains everything, and so they scratched all of that and started from scratch to something called molecular orbital theory. So that technically this stuff that will be covered we don't do this. And when we cover, technically it's not completely true. But it does serve a purpose because it allows us to make very good predictions, in particular on the three-dimensional shapes of molecules. So while the, the nature of how bonding truly occurs is not truly what's happening there, it, they are very good models for predicting. And Kind of keep in mind things from the point of view that we take a look at it. So. <clears throat> and so, lower set structures are basically is how we connect the main group elements, one through eight, into structures so that we can try and give most of the elements eight valence electrons, which means that the S and P. Shells or substrates, let's say, the S and P substrates are full. So S2, P6. That means it's full, and that's the highest level of stability when the shells are full. So, with the exception of hydrogen, hydrogen only has the N equals 1 shell available, and when N equals 1, the maximum number of electrons is 2. So hydrogen can only have 2 electrons in a bond, it will only have 1 bond. But it does show how bonding occurs. So hydrogen molecule, the bond between the two hydrogens forms as the atoms move closer. And in particular, their nucleus are getting close to each other. Now, the nucleus are positive. The cloud around the nucleus is negative. But even though electrons are negative, and we think of light charges repelling each other, that's true for the nucleus, for the positive charges. From one atom to another one. But within the nucleus, you have a bunch of protons together, above hydrogen. Once we have helium, you have two protons, three, so and so forth. Well, those protons occupy the same space. And there is some stability within that. Likewise, electrons like to be paired up. So even though they have the same charge, when they have that opposite spin, they like to be in pairs and then can occupy the same space. And so basically, when the two nuclei come together, the electrons that are on the outside, they end up sharing that space, their orbital, and that ends up creating a bond. And so once that shared space is, that's what we call that covalent bond. So there is a maximum and minimum distance at which the two are apart that provides the strongest bond. Too far, and basically they're separate atoms, too close, and then positive nuclei, then begin to repel each other. And that takes over sugar. Now in the sun, that energy is enough to bring the nuclei together, but <clears> then <throat> we have a nuclear reaction. Hydrogen turns into helium. So somewhere between those two extremes is that we have this. But that bond is created by that overlap of that electron bond. Okay, that sharing of that space. Some concepts and rules in terms of the structures. 
molecules represented by Lewis structure in which the valence electrons, and so remember that goes by the group number, group one, one dot, group two, two dots, group three, three dots. You put a dot on each side until we get to four, all four sides are covered, then we begin to pair them up once we're at group five, six, seven, and eight. And basically it becomes a puzzle piece. So here we have ammonia in H3. So you have nitrogen with five valence electrons. And if I want to complete all this, then I'm missing an electron here, here, and here. If we're bringing in hydrogen with one electron, well, each one of those places can be occupied by hydrogen atom. Hydrogen gets the two that it needs. Nitrogen gets the three extra ones to get to eight. And everybody is happy. This is covalent. Yes. <coughs> so it'll be the sharing of electrons. So once we form those bonds, then we can change that sharing of electrons into straight lines. Every line counts as two electrons. And we can call those bonded electrons, bonded pairs, or shared pairs. And then the electrons that, are, that belong only to one atom, we call those lone pairs, or non-bonded pairs. So these are, you said, not true, right? These were theories? They're, well, they weren't theories, and then they changed because they could only explain so much. Okay. So Lewis was very basic. It, it told us how kind of we get to A, but it didn't allow for predicting three-dimensional shapes and all of this. And then when we started predicting, so for the prediction wasn't quite what we expected to be, and so the conversation was changed to the SPR. And then with the discovery of quantum physics, and that's where we're at now. The molecular world. Um, and so, not that it's basically it's not true in the sense that the molecule looks like that, the way we draw it. Thank you. That's in some sense that, that is not true. So, remember that we have those. And keep in mind, this is before. Um, so Lewis, the structures came before this, before we knew about shells and subshells and the way we form. This is all based on quantum. Okay. So that here we have, you know, we draw the electrons as if we can see them and we tell you, you know, there's a line between them. But it's not uh, the shape. That's not the case. We don't know where the electrons are at. They're somewhere within the clock. They're all this moving. Okay. And so. So now when they knew which direction they were moving, like the shape. The shape. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when did that happen? Because all through elementary school we were shown like Lewis structures and things like that. So when was it just like more chemistry in elementary school? Yeah, like they started introducing it. Well, I was <laughs> private school. Oh, I went to private school too, but always, I mean, they were like, Jesus does not believe in chemistry. So. <laughs> Science is the devil. Hey, it's you know, it, it's, we're still teaching it nowadays. Once again, because it, it serves the purpose of prediction. 
it, it, it allows us to make very good predictions without getting too complicated. You know, it, you don't need uh, kind of like, you don't need the expensive tool to get the same job done that like the less expensive tool. And that's the purpose of this. So you still learn the active role in biology, and you still learn the fluid cell structures, because quantum chemistry is that's to So it's really <laughs> the only difference is the 3D kind of? The, well, Basically, this is how the current model works. Now here, you're showing the dots of electrons for clarity, but those dots are not there. It's just a cloud of space in that region. Okay. Now, if that cloud is pretty symmetrical and even in terms of color, then that's covalent bond. If it starts becoming not symmetrical, then we have a ionic bond. Area of high electric density is an area of low electric density, but picture this without those dots. And that's kind of a new modern version of, you know, how we represent bondings based on computer models. Okay. So that if we represent this molecule, take away those lines. And that's what it would look like. Once again, the lines here are drawn because if you just see, you know, a bunch of colors like this, you're like, well, what molecule is that? <clears throat> so within this model, so that you know what molecule it is that we're looking at. That's, yeah, that's right. But the quantum per model is just that cloud of electron density throughout the whole structure. Let's have a purpose later on for other types of predictions, but not for what we were trying to So um, it works for what we're using. And, and that's, once again, going back to the idea, we don't need a complicated tool for what it is that we want to use, which is how do these molecules look in three dimensions? So we'll draw it like this, even though it looks like this. Because if you look at this, you can't really look at this. Or you don't even know what element it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so same principle. Atoms that are shared in between two atoms, we can remove those from the line. Once you have the line, that comes as two electrons. Okay. And within that sharing, everybody has say. So that fluorine has A, that fluorine has A. But in order for each one to have A, we have to count those two electrons for the sets. And that's what we can mark. And that's what we're sharing. So the patterns that we see in terms of the group numbers with the exception of boron. Okay, boron is the only non-metal in group three. Okay, so it can only make three bonds, which means boron compounds are always short of an octet. They never get to make an octet. 
for signing up electrons. And that's okay. It's okay. You know, we can try to get to A, but if we don't get to A, that's okay. We do not have to force it. And then hydrogen only has the first shell available to it. When n equals one, the only subshell available is S, and that's two electrons. So hydrogen can only make one more. But once we get to group four, basically, four electrons, we need four more to get to A, so it will make four bonds. Group five nonmetals, they have five valence electrons, they need three more to get to A, so they will like they like to make three bonds. Six nonmetals have six. They need two to get to eight, so they like to make two ones. And finally, group seven nonmetals need one electron, and so they like to make one bond. The operator for though being they like two. They do not have two, or nor they nor do they always do. But if we're looking at patterns then you're going to see group four with four lines. You're going to see group five with three lines and a lone pair. You're going to see group six with two lone pairs and two lines. And you're going to see group seven with three lone pairs mm -hmm. and one line. Why, yes. uh, what makes a group 1A and 3A different? Why are they not even trying to? Because they're more towards the metal side than the non-metal side. Oh, okay. Well, for boron. Hydrogen, it's because it's, it doesn't need, remember the reason we're looking at A is because it's we're trying to show. get to six. Yeah. But on the first row of the periodic table, their P doesn't exist. Oh, yeah. All you have is, one, two electrons on the first shell. That's it. Yeah, so it's, it'll only take one to fill. There's only one box. Okay, that's right. So we still haven't got into metallic bonds, right? Is that where those would be? From the first? Right, but we won't cover that. Now, we can still make predictions on simple ionic molecules. Um, one metal in the middle, or a non-metal in the middle, and metals on the inside. And, and the rules that will go will can be used for some of the simpler ionic molecules. So we're not going to get into metallic bonds. No. Okay. Okay. So drawing the rules I'm going to give you for Lewis substructures. These are my rules, <coughs> and they work without you having to worry about exceptions. Rule number one, draw a skeletal structure. What does that mean? For most molecules, for most compounds, the first element in the formula is the central, which means it's a one in the middle. So whatever comes first in the formula, put that in the middle, and then attach everything else with one line to the central atom. The exception are acids. Acids are compounds that begin with hydrogen. So you see hydrogen at the beginning, but hydrogen cannot be in the middle because it can only make one line. So if it's an acid, if hydrogen is at the very <coughs> beginning, then the central atom is the one that comes right after. Rule number two, count the number of valence electrons. And that's by the group. Group one, one, group two, two, group three, group four. Hydrogen. Once you put a line on hydrogen, hydrogen's half. That's all it needs. Four. 
Okay, if there are left over electrons. Place them in pairs on the central Check the central atom for any metals to see if there's an octet on the middle. the previous steps and you end up with more than eight on that central atom, you're good. That's the way it's supposed to. Less than eight. Here we have two choices. If we do not have a combination of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or sulfur, you're done. Don't do anything else. It's okay to have this study also. Okay, we're looking at carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur. What happens with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur? They can create multiple covalent bonds, which are only two elements. So I can have carbon, carbon double, carbon, oxygen, double, carbon, nitrogen, double. <coughs> or triple bonds. So they can double or triple bonds. So if we do have Using the electrons that were already placed. Okay, you do not just add a line on the way. You have to move electrons that were on the outside and move them to the middle. And we will cut examples of those.
now these rules extend to polyatomic ions also. If we do have a polyatomic ion, uh, then you add an extra electron for its negative charge. And for ammonium, NH4+, plus, because it's positive, you would take away the electron. Okay, so rule number one, draw a skeletal structure. So first element in the formula is the one in the middle. And it doesn't matter which way the bonds are pointing, it starts with hydrogen, then it's the next element of the one that is in the middle. between SO3, the compound, sulfur trioxide, and SO3 to minus, the polyatomic ion, which is a sulfite. Likewise, this is a compound, nitrogen dioxide. This is the ion, nitrite. We get the next thing. So that's step number one. Step number two, count the number of vacancy electrons. Group four. Group one, the electrons, group five, group one, three of them. Group one, group six, group five, group seven, three, group seven, group six. Just going by the group number. The group number tells us how many minutes electrons, and then the multiply times the subscript. So when we do the Lewis structures, we have to use exactly the number of electrons, no more or less. Rule number three: place eight electrons on the outside atoms, except for hydrogen. So hydrogen is hydrogen is hydrogen is hydrogen. Or else, basically, each line counts as two electrons. So we place three in pairs.
You said each line counts as eight? Two. Each one of these lines counts as two. Oh. And since we're going for eight, Everybody already has two, so we need to add six more, which means three pairs. Two, four, six, eight. I've used up eight electrons. I have eight. There's no leftover ones. Say here. Two, four, six. We have two left over. We're on the central atom. Two, four. I have eight. So I have four left over. That's two pairs. They go on the central atom. Eight plus eight is sixteen. Like a is 24. We have 26 available. We have two left over. Eight and eight is 16 plus eight is 24. No left over. Eight and eight is 16, 24, 32, 40, 48. 48, no left over. 8 plus 8 is 16, 24, 32, 8, 16, 24, we have 26, there's 2 left over. So if you do it correctly, you shouldn't be over, correct? You know what I mean? Oh. Well, you shouldn't be over That's what I mean. here before we look at this. Okay. Yes, right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. You did it wrong. Yes, yes. I was thinking the other way. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, if you count, if you count 20 and there's only 17 here, we did something wrong in one of the previous steps. That's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. 8 and 8, that's 16. We have 18. That's 2 left over. 8 and 8, that's 16, there's 17. We don't have enough for a pair. We still need two places. So you could leave it by itself. It doesn't have to come in a pair? No. It likes to. And that's when you have radical switches. Very, very radical. Very strong oxidizing agents. Twenty-four, eight, sixteen, twenty-four, we have twenty-six, two left over. Eight, sixteen, twenty-four, twenty-four. No. <coughs> Questions after step number four. Very good. Mm -hmm. Step five. Check the central atom to see if we have the electrons. So we look at carbon two, four, six, eight. That's it. We're good. We're done. Now we're going to use a notation. 
that's going to have the form of A, B, A, C, Y. Where A represents the central atom. B represents the attached atoms. Basically, how many are attached? It doesn't matter if they're the same or different, as long as they're attached. Okay. And then E is the number of lone pairs on central atoms. And this label is going to help us in the next section. So CH4, this is an AB4 molecule. So that's how we're going to categorize it. Central atom, four things attached. It doesn't have any E's because it doesn't have any lone pairs on the middle atom. So you, so that you change the X into how many ever attached atoms it is. Okay. Two, four, six, eight. We have an octave, so we're good. This would be an A, B, three, E. So there's three atoms attached to nitrogen and one lone pair, one E. That E represents the lone pairs. We've got oxygen, two, four, six, eight. We're good. This is an AB, two, E, two. We've got a phosphorus, two, four, six, eight. So we're good. This is an AB, three, E. Three atoms attached and one lone pair. Got more. Two, four, six. Eight, three. We're less than eight. Do we have a combination of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and sulfur? No. No. Don't do anything else. And you said boron can only make three bonds anyway, right? That's it. We're done. Okay. It's three. It's good. It's fine. Oh, you don't have a problem. Oh, okay. You don't get to make A, that's when you're here, that's okay. If it's not, it's, not those. it's less than A. Okay. Central atom, three things attached, no lone pairs on the central atom. So, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. More than eight, then. Oh, it's it more than matter. eight? You're done. That's it. Leave it alone. Don't mess with it. It's okay. This is eight. an AB6. Check card. Two, four. We have less than eight, and we do have a combination of carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. So, so we create double or triple ones to get that central atom to A, but we do not add any electrons. We move the ones that already have. Remember, this is sharing electrons. Mm -hmm. Sharing is pairing. So oxygen says, all right, but I'll help you out. Mm -hmm. So oxygen takes two of its own pairs and shares them with carbon. But now we're still too short. It only has six. Two plus six. So the other atoms are okay. I'll come in and help out too. Very important, we did not add electrons, we moved them. The electrons were kind of already placed there. See, after here, after this point, we already accounted for all electrons after step four. So you cannot add or take away. But we can move them from. Do we need to? Okay, question. Okay, so I get that rule. So it's only if they're interacting with each other or only if one of them is in the problem? No, you need two. So, so they have to interact with each other. Right. Now, it can be carbon. Carbon, carbon. Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. That's when it gets weird and you have to do double lines. Right. Okay. So, you do need two of them. Yeah. But in just both. Okay. In that company. But they have to be between. Those four. Okay. Got it. And then 
that's when you have to make the double line, but okay. And so oxygen, because oxygen is sharing, it didn't lose its oxygen. It's okay, that's eight, two, four, six, eight. And then carbon has two forces. Yeah. Four, two, four, six, eight. Doesn't matter if the things are attached by single or double or triple bonds. That's just how many are attached. We have two atoms attached. Two, four, six, eight. We're good. That's going to be four. Two, four, six, eight. So we're good. This is an A, B, three, E. Two, four, six. We're right. SME, mm -hmm. and we do have nitrogen and oxygen. So you're just going to make one double bond, right? We only need one, and it doesn't matter which one you pick. It doesn't matter if you choose the oxygen on the left or the oxygen on the right. One will be double bonded. That gets us to eight. We don't need to do the other. You make this a lot easier than the book does, because when I was reading by myself, I was like, I don't understand what's going on. Two atoms attached, one lone pair on there. Now the next one, we won't be able to get to A. Now, and remember, we still have the rules. Row one, two electrons maximum. Row two, eight electrons. Row three, 18, and it increases after that. That's why hydrogen can only have two. Nitrogen only has room for eight, no more than eight. We're sure here. We're at five. So we can share two and get it to seven. But I cannot share another two because that puts me at nine. And we cannot get to nine. Eight is the maximum. They're second row elements. I, I'm confused because didn't you say earlier that those lines represented two because it's a bond? Yes. So where would you get? I guess I'll ask you later. I don't get that at all. Okay. So where are, we, where are we at here? I don't know. Two, four, five. Okay. Which means we're less than eight. Okay. And we do have nitrogen and oxygen. Okay. So we try to get it to eight. Yeah. But we can't because five is an odd number. So we can get close though. So those lines change. I can get closer. Okay. So it's only five. If I turn two, I get it to seven, which is better than just five. But I cannot have that oxygen oh, share two. I did it. Because that puts me two, four, six, eight, nine. Right, got it. So that's as far as we can get. Okay. Now, with the row three elements, sulfur, phosphorus, you can get over it. And if you have to get to nine, that's fine. That's only for nitrogen right. that you can go over. And so this up here, and, they, and we treat that as a lone pair. Even though it's not a pair. But it takes up the space of what a pair would take up. That's an AB2. So 2, 4, 6, 8. We're good. Then here, just like here, we're at six, we need two more. Sulfur and oxygen are part of that group of four. It doesn't matter which one you do. Yeah, and then you just pick one. Just pick one. Two, four, six, eight. And this is a three. Follow those steps, and you will always get the so correct. Six. Which one's the X, please? Or simple um, So that's what you put how many bonding pairs. And then simple meaning one central atom. 
So we're not going to like organic. Like how many, like how many bonded um, atoms? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. To, yeah, how many atoms are bonded? And then you don't have to worry about what are exceptions where you have less or more because they work themselves out. And the double and triple bonds also work themselves out. All of the steps do not skip any step. Let's switch them on. Do not let your instinct get the better of you. And force double bonds when they're shooting. But this is for the Lewis structure, right? Everything else is based on that formula. Once you get the right Lewis set structure and we assign this formula, everything else is based on this. What is this called, this little formula? Shnoni? BACPR. Valence shell electron. Valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And, and there's a assumption. We've got some of these. So you got methane, ammonia, and water. Got PCO3. PCO3, SS6. The sharing of electrons is not always equal share. Sometimes it's an equal share. And so covalent bonds can be subcategorized into polar and nonpolar. to assign <coughs> those labels. So we define electronegativity of an atom as its ability to attract the shared electrons in a bond. The more electronegative the atom, the mm -hmm. more those electrons spend time closer to that atom than the other. In terms of patterns in the periodic table, electronegativity goes along with the attraction to the nucleus that we talked about in the last chapter. From left to right, attraction <coughs> increases while electronegativity increases. From top to bottom, we are adding shells and we're getting further away from the nucleus, so attraction decreases, electronegativity also decreases. So the most electronegative atoms are on the top right of the right table, the least electronegative are on the bottom right. Non-metals are more electronegative than metals. And remember, it's the ability to attract electrons. Right? Well, non-metals like to be negative. That means that they should have a stronger ability to attract electrons. Metals like to be positive. They like to give up electrons. So that means if they're giving them up, they're not that attractive to them. Lori? And basically think of it as a round-robin competition. So they put two elements together, see which one wins, that one moves on to the next stage, then the loser goes to the loser. Bracket. And then they match them up again, winners keep moving up, losers keep moving to loser brackets. And then once you sort them all out, you put them on a 4.0 scale. So flooring beat everybody out gets the side the highest grade of 4.0. Cesium was last. Cesium couldn't beat anybody. It never got the electrons. 
So I guess assign the lowest value of the set. And then all the other ones are in each other. So fluorine is the most electronegative atom, followed by oxygen. Oxygen comes in second place. And then nitrogen and chlorine are tied for third. How are we um, going to know these values? Is this something we need to memorize, or is this something? Um, no, I would give you provide? those. Okay. On a test, I would provide you those values. On a uh, homework question, you, know, you do need access to the table at the book or the part. Okay. And then this table comes here. Yeah. Let's simplify this process. If you have a metal, non metal combination, that's ionic pure. Regardless of the difference, that's an ionic bond. That's how we define ionic compounds. So we start with a metal and it's followed by a non metal or polyatomic ion. Right. Covalent bonds occur between two non metals. Okay. If the electronegativity differs, though, it's on the lower end of the range, and basically we're talking about 0.3 or less, okay. then we're talking about non polar covalent. The difference in electronegativity is 0.3 or less, including 0.3. And then we assign that non polar. And if it's about 0.3 between two non metals, then it's polar. So non polar covalent bonds are first between two non metals. And it has to because covalent bonds are between non metals. What will be nonpolar? The electronegativity difference is 0.3 or less. That means that the sharing is pretty equal. We'll see like this. In a nonpolar? Mm -hmm. Okay. In nonpolar. Now, obviously, if you have two of the same atoms, the difference is always going to be zero. Is above 0.3, not including 0.3, then it's polar covalent between two numbers. The bigger the difference, the more polar it is. And that's an unequal sharing of electrons, which means the more electronegative atom gets the electron, gets the electrons uh, more time than the one with the least. Here, so five point five one. Now. now, within the textbook, they kind of put a ceiling on it. At which point, they'll say it becomes ionic. Don't worry about that ceiling. As long as it's two non-metals and it's about point three, it's four. Once you get to metal and metal, then it's automatically ionic. And remember, for this, once again, there are no metal loops, either on the left-hand side of the staircase or the right-hand side of the staircase. Now, if the difference then is about 0.3 between those two nonmetals, then that polar bond creates what's called a dipole moment. So dipole, basically, is letting us that there's electron density, or the electrons are hanging out, uh, that's not symmetrical. And we indicate the region where the electrons hang out most of the time with a negative delta. And where they don't hang out as much with a positive delta. And then the direction of the dipole, the tail points towards the positive, and the head towards the negative. Electronegative atom gets a negative delta, the least electronegative gets a positive one, and then draw an arrow from the positive to negative. And that points in the direction of the dike for that polar bond. <laughs> and 
So this is the selenium titanium that it's mentioned in the book, that 1.8. Ignore that 1.8. Ignore it. Yes. Ignore that 1.8. Okay. If it's metal, non metal, it's ionic pure. If it's two non metals, then it's covalent, either non polar or And that's because you can find elements that are in extremes in which you will be on the wrong side of that one point. metals in which the sharing is pretty What did you say this one was? Well, that hand side? Yeah. So two non-metals and you were talking about 0.3 or less. And then the middle one about 0.3 and then on the right hand side that's a metal non-metal combination. Ignore that 1.8 because you do have metal non metal combinations that are less than 1.8, and there are a handful of non metal non metal that are above 1.8. There is an overlap. So just to avoid that confusion, metal non metal is automatically out. Kind of to avoid the negatives, just put the higher one first. That's wrong. So the table is provided right for them. Kind of test I will provide you with the values. Okay. Isn't it on our periodic table no. that you gave us? No. The pattern, uh, but not the actual values. Okay. Oxygen is 3.5. Chlorine is 3.0. So the same. And then hydrogen is 2.1. Cl is 3.0. So A, because it begins with a metal, that's ion. B, we're at 0.5 difference, that's polar. Or C, that's zero, because it's the same, so that's non-polar. And then the last one, we're above 0.3 between two non metals so that's polar. Okay.
section, I need to do it in one. So, that man is gonna get lost in translation. So we won't start this one, but I don't want to mention one more thing. <coughs> Having a polar bond does not necessarily mean that the molecule itself will be polar. Okay, that three-dimensional shape of the structure. Uh, that's a factor. But the whole molecule as a whole is polar. And so based on these labels right here, if the simple act Do not have any lone pairs. Okay. So the ones that are A, B, X, there are no X. Okay. They are non polar. If all B's are the same as. All the examples that we did, all the B's are the same. So AB4, they're all oxygens. AB2, they're both oxygens. AB6, they're all chlorines. They're all chlorines. Okay. <coughs> now, an example, for example, would be, uh, say, chloroform. Chloroform is CHCO3. that are attached are not all the same. One of them is different. That makes it important. If they're all the same, they're not. But if one or more are different, well, once you have one different thing, it becomes polar. Even if there <coughs> appears to be symmetry to the structure. Because in the textbook, they talk about symmetry. So, I have this. C is two CO2. It seems like there may be symmetry to it. It doesn't matter. If they're not the same, it's four. If they're all the same, not four. So these labels become very important to make those predictions. Here and then we'll do the ACPR for the shapes. 